reading. Yeah. Be back. And I'll talk slower this time. <laughs> Wait, that was so wait, come here. Come here. Good morning, Otterbein, and welcome to the house of the Lord on a beautiful, brisk Sunday morning in Lent. Got a bunch of announcements here. I want to start with making an announcement about announcements, though. So we've got so many right now because this is the we're coming in on the Easter season, and there's a lot going on in the life of the church. I want to give everybody a heads up that on Easter morning. I'm only going to make one announcement. Our service, we're going to be especially conscious about being welcoming and helpful to visitors. And so we're not going to throw a whole bunch of data at them at the beginning of the service. We're going to focus on one thing, which will be whatever our next big event is going to be, whether it's uh, Mother's Day or um, the next sermon series or whatever I come up with between now and then. So that week, it will be especially important to pay attention to emails and to make sure that anything that you want to go into, that you want everybody to know about needs to be in the newsletter and stuff like that. The other thing I want to tell you about this morning, as you might have noticed on the way in, Scott was doing a pretty good job of pointing it out to everybody. I, <coughs> there is a joys and concerns sheet out in the, in the narthex now. Now, when I do joys and concerns, if you want to speak up and raise a joy or a concern, you don't need to write anything on that sheet because you're going to say it out loud. That's more for people who want something to be said, but hate raising their hand and saying something in the congregation. So you can put it down there and then I will read it. Just once again, be sure that you're not sharing anything confidential. <coughs> Excuse me. That whatever is on there is something that it's okay for me to say publicly and <coughs> on the internet. So make sure you've got permission to share it. All right, so all the stuff going on, the altar flowers are placed in loving memory um, by, by Sue and Andy Watts in loving memory of their parents. The pulpit flowers are in loving memory of Katherine Johnson by Trina. The 2023 Hark Hike to raise money for Micah's backpack is coming up. There is a display in Bishop's Hall and there are a bunch of different ways to support that. I think there's a 6K and a 10K and then there's the Appalachian Challenge, which I know some of our folks are doing not sure I'm ready to do that yet. I think you have to average three miles per hour to do that. And over rocks, I'm not even two miles per hour. So I don't know. I'll take a look at it. Um, we are having the Guatemala mission trip coming up this summer. That's the last week of July, first week of August, July 29 through August 5. There's a display on that in the hall as well if you're thinking about that. We're having a game day today for youth grades 6 through 12. Immediately following this service, we'll be heading downstairs. Lunch will be provided. If anybody um, is in that rough age group and wants to participate, participate, please stay. Bikes for the World is coming up on April 29. We're going to need volunteers that day. The event is in the morning. I think we'll probably need volunteers for a bigger window than that. 
The Easter egg hunt will be on April 2 at 2 o'clock p.m. at the Linden Hall Farm. Children and youth through grade 12 are invited to participate in the fun and games. Let's see what else we got. We will need to fill Easter eggs for that day. So we need candy. And there's a big box for candy donations in the lobby by the office. And the COVID clinic is staying longer than we thought. It's going to be here through April with one exception. Easter Monday, the church will be closed and the, the um, COVID clinic um, will not be here that day. And last but not least, please plan on being here a lot the week before Easter. Palm Sunday, uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, we'll have a tenebrae service. That's going to be a very special week here. So, please join with me in the call to worship. Or actually, are you ready to do the call to worship? You go right ahead and do the call to worship. Okay. Please join me in our call to worship. God does not see us as mortal see. We look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Jesus, Jesus light, light of, of the, the world, world give, give us, us eyes to see, see as you see. Once we lived in darkness, but now, as children of light, we are called to what is good and right and true. Jesus, Jesus light of the world, give, give us, us eyes to see as you see. Now let's rise and sing together our opening song, Rest. Just a 
children of God's light, we are called to do what is pleasing to the Lord, to participate in what is good and right and true, and expose what is unfruitful and evil. Knowing that we turn from the light, we bring our confession to God, so that what is hidden is in us becomes visible, and the shadows of our hearts may be illumined, illumined by grace. Let us join in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we are people who still love darkness rather than light. We keep shameful deeds secret, but flaunt our occasional acts of virtue. We see ourselves as blameless, but pass judgment on to others. We do not stand firmly with those vulnerable, but step back protecting ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. Bring us into your light, that we may see ourselves rightly. Bring us into your light, that we may know ourselves beloved. Bring us into your light, that we may live more fruitful lives. Keep raising us, we pray, from the deadness of sin, and shine us with your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, light of the world. Amen. The psalmist assures us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us, even pursue us all the days of our life. As God's forgiven people, we receive the goodness and mercy and live a new life in the grace of Jesus Christ. We will live as children of the light, for Christ shines upon us. And now our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, illuminate our hearts and minds as the scriptures are read and proclaimed so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may see what is good and right and true. And seeing, help us to do what is pleasing to you, so that your glory becomes visible in our words and deeds. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Join us in our Psalter, Psalm 3, and it's UMH page 754. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes us lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, restores my life. Leads me in the right path for the sake of the Lord's name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you, me, the rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oils, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live.
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Scripture lesson is John 9, 1 through 41. Listen for the word of the Lord. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spits on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This world means sent. 
So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is the man? They asked. I don't know, he said. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and they, that had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one who was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how we can see, he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said that this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been bribed. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I can see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as far for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, they were steeped in its sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he told, found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking for you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What are we blind to? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the sins of my mouth and the sins of my mouth, the words of my mouth, <laughs> and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Freudian. Try not to sin with my mouth this morning. <laughs> so back when the pandemic first started, it was interesting to hear how 
not just religious leaders, but just people of faith in general reacted to it. Because a lot of un things I thought were unhelpful were said at the time. A few people said things like, you know, we're a sinful nation and God has judged us and this is our punishment. Not a whole lot of that, but there was an awful lot of everything happens for a reason, so we must have faith that this is God's will. Did you hear anything like that at the time? Do you hear things like that other times? Yeah, as a Methodist, <clears throat> I'm always uncomfortable when people talk that way because Methodists have a very strong doctrine of free will. So some Methodists jokingly say that our take on that is everything happens for a reason, and sometimes that reason is you're an idiot. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, we don't, we don't really mean it maliciously like that, because sometimes the person next to you was the idiot, and you just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but whatever happened was not God's plan, because we believe that the world is a broken place, that God gave us free will, and we used it to break the planet. We believe that God is still present in the planet and, and acting, and that God is always trying to reconcile us with his original plan, but this is not his original plan. The world is, at best, a shadow of his plan. It is, at best, an imperfect representation of God's will. There will come a day when justice shall reign... What is the quote? When justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We, we have that promise that that day will come, but it's not today. Today, life isn't fair. So when pandemics come and all kinds of other things happen, what do we do with that? Well, today we wanna first make the claim that our God is a God who, is, who, who loves us and heals us in the context of a broken world that not everything that happens is God's will. So in our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus is dealing with this man who was born blind, and he heals him. But before he heals them, the disciples ask an awful question. Whose fault is it that he's blind? Is it his fault for his sins, or was it his parents' fault for their sins? Now that's interesting, because he was born blind, right? Right? Now, of course, there are world religions out there to this day that believe that everybody gets what they deserve. So if you're in a situation, you brought it on yourself. And if you've been in that situation from birth, well, that means you did something in your previous life to bring this on yourself. And in fact, sometimes the adherents of those religions would say, you see this person born to this situation? This is their punishment from their previous life. So don't interfere. Let them live in their suffering. Otherwise, they won't learn anything. That's one way of looking at the world. And another way of looking at the world that's less common is people saying, well, he might not have deserved it, but his parents must have, or God wouldn't have done this to them. Jesus says that's not how it works. It's nobody's fault that he was born blind, just worked out that way. But, he says, God will use this opportunity and you will see God's power through this man, provide an opportunity for everyone to see God's healing power. What an interesting turn of phrase, to see God's healing power. It's all about seeing, isn't it, this story? It's all about seeing. Throughout Christian history, People have seen this story as being not just a story about a miraculous healing, but a metaphor about faith, what it means to have faith, and how that changes our perception of the world around us. Christians talk a lot about discerning the will of God, right? We use the word discernment a lot. In the Methodist world, we talk about congregational discernment, because we believe that that God doesn't whisper in pastor's ears, this is what your congregation should do. God talks to the entire church. So we have 
discernment processes. What, what does the word discernment mean? It means to not just see something, but to correctly identify it. So, for example, I, I can still pretty much discern everybody in the room right now, but this is a mess. I, I, I can't make anything out of this at all. I can't tell what any of those words are. I can't even tell where there's spaces between words. But now I can discern it. So, the further I can get from something and still discern it, the better discernment I've got. And so that's why we, we value people who are able to discern things quickly, early, from a distance. And we believe that God is a big part of that process. So in the Gospel of John, when Jesus talks about darkness and light and blindness and sight, he's talking about our spiritual eyes. He's talking about our ability to see certain things. So in this story, everybody but the blind man sees something. I mean that word literally right now. Everybody but the blind man sees something, but they don't all recognize what they see. They each discern something different. They don't all see the world the way it really is, so they need to be disillusioned. And that's a word that kind of has a negative connotation, right? Disillusionment. And I remember once when I was in seminary, my doctoral program, I was upset about something and I said, oh, I'm so disillusioned. And the woman sitting next to me said, well, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. You sound disappointed. I said, how is it a good thing? She says, well, an illusioned person sees things that aren't there. That's not good. That's what disillusioned means. It means to stop seeing things that aren't there, to no longer have illusions, to see the world as it actually is. That's what you want, right? I mean, illusions block you from seeing things. Well, no. yeah, I guess you're right. Disillusionment isn't a bad thing. It's, it's, en it's enlightenment. So the people that Jesus is with need to be disillusioned. They need to be enlightened. So there are different kinds of reactions that different people in this story have, and we learn a lot about these people from the way they react. Look, look at the man's neighbors. They have a, an argument over whether or not it's actually him. Now, these are people who have known him since birth, and some of them are saying, yeah, I think that's him. Others are going, no, nah, it looks like him, but that ain't him. H how is that possible? It's possible because all they've ever seen is a blind beggar. That defined everything about him for them. You change that one thing, they don't know who he is anymore. That's amazing. How often do we see people at such a shallow level that we allow one thing to define who they are and if that one thing changes or if it turns out that that one thing turned out to not be true to begin with, well, we don't know who we're dealing with anymore. I mean, I think about myself. People who know me well would say that my beliefs are idiosyncratic. And by that, what they would mean is that I can't be categorized easily. I don't neatly fit into people's definitions of liberal or conservative, whether we're talking about politics or religion. I've got beliefs that can be identified as any one of those things. I can't be categorized or labeled easily. That doesn't keep people from doing it, though, especially people who don't know me well will categorize me or label me based on one thing that they know about me. And if there's 10 other things about me that belie that label, they don't even see those things. So then if that one thing turns out to not be true, maybe they made an assumption, or if 
I changed my mind on that one thing. This guy doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> uh, some people know God at a very superficial level. And if God does something that they're not expecting God to do, their mind is blown. Of course, the Bible says that God does unexpected things all the time. It's actually one of his defining characteristics is that he does things that we don't expect him to do. See, here's the thing. If you don't know somebody that well, and that one little thing you know about them changes, then you don't know them anymore. But if you know somebody really well, and one thing about them changes, it doesn't really change your overall understanding of them that much. That is absolutely the case with God as well. So look at the religious leaders. They've got a very strange reaction. Because... They're, they're, they are blind to any facts that don't fit their belief system. Does that remind you of anybody you know? I know it doesn't remind any of you of you. Because <laughs> none of us do that, right? <laughs> uh, there was a joke about 10 years ago. It was crafted as a partisan political joke which was a shame because when you do that, only half the country thinks it's funny. And it's an epic joke, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna retool it to be about preachers. So the guy says about his pastor, he says, the thing I love the most about my pastor is his consistency. If he says something on Sunday morning, you know he's still gonna believe that on Tuesday morning. And it doesn't matter what happened on Monday. <laughs> right? We're going to ignore anything that happens that is not part of what we believe. And that's why we live in a world where people actually don't just have different opinions, they have different facts. We go looking for the facts that support what we already wanted to believe. And if it doesn't support what we already wanted to believe, then it's not true. Well, we didn't invent that. That's what's happening in this story. The guy was blind. But now he can see, but he says that Jesus did it, and we know that Jesus couldn't have done it because. They've witnessed a miracle, but they didn't see a miracle. Because if they did see it, they'd have to change their beliefs, and that, they can't have that. That's not strength of conviction. That's foolishness. Having a deep sense of faith and knowing God intimately changes the way you see the world. When you see the world the way God sees the world, you will suddenly see problems that you never noticed before. But you'll also see solutions you never would have considered before. You're going to see God at work in places where you never would have expected to see God. And then you'll find yourself wanting to join in with God working in those places that you might not ever have considered going to before. In Romans 8.28, Paul says, and this is, this is where people get that, that misguided statement, everything happens for a reason. They're misunderstanding this verse. Romans 8.28. Paul says, we know that all things work together for good, but that's not the end of the sentence. For those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. I added the and, but that's implied in the text. For those who love God and who are called according to his purpose, things work together for good. It is not true that everything happens for a reason, but it is true that God can redeem anything and use it for good. There's a tremendous difference between those two beliefs. That's what the resurrection is all about. 
God can redeem anything no matter how bad. Saying that does not make it good. If it was good, then we wouldn't need the redemption. It would just stay the way it is. So we are in a world where we are surrounded by sickness and chaos, but we have a God who heals the sick and brings order to chaos. So as Christians, our job then is to look around us with open eyes and see where God is in the world at work doing that and to draw attention to it and to point it out and to become a part of that. I haven't been here for a whole year yet. I've only been here about nine months. But one of the things that just amazes me is how many nonprofits there are in a city this small. We got tons of nonprofits here doing great kingdom building work. And our job is to partner with them as we do and will continue to do. So the thing that I want to leave you with this morning, folks, is the people who think that the world is getting worse are blind. They're blind. These are the best days to be alive. Starvation globally, even post-pandemic, is at an all-time low. People's chances of dying violently globally are at an all-time low. The poverty rates, Everything measurable globally, it's never been like this. These are the best days in the history of the human race. If we see the world the way God sees it, we cannot help but to be hopeful for tomorrow. Let us pray. Holy God, why is it that we look but don't see? Bring us again and again into your light until your ways become visible to us and bear fruit in us. Touch us so that we are utterly changed before and after, now and then, that we can all say one thing I do know, that I was blind, but now I see. Lord, we believe Help our unbelief. In Christ's light we pray. Amen. So we've got some joys and concerns to share. We've got a couple of joys. Where did I put my joy? Um, it is Brett Ritchie's birthday on the 21st. It was my birthday yesterday. And um, I got a great gift that I didn't talk about at the first service I should have mentioned. Um, Becky got us tickets to see... Bruce Springsteen on um, September 9, which September 9 is the day that we met in 1990. So it's, it's sort of a double, I don't think we're going to do anything for our wedding anniversary, but that's a, a big anniversary for us. We remember that day pretty well. I don't remember my wedding all that well. That day is kind of a blur. But the day I met her, I remember very, very well. Um, but it, it, it's really cool. I'm going to tell the story. Now, my parents watch this service every, every week, so they're going to hear all this. So... When I was in high school, was the, it was the Born in the USA tour, and I wanted to go to RFK and see the concert, but my parents wouldn't let me go because rock concerts attract the wrong crowd. And so that night we're watching the news because my family watched the news every night, and here's Ted Koppel coming out of RFK. He's just been to the concert, and they're interviewing him. I was, oh, gosh, Mom, look at the kind of people that go to see Bruce Springsteen. Ted Koppel. I could have really been influenced. So I, you know, so I never let them live it down. So they're very happy that now I get to go. And they said, now if we, all we got to worry about now is the Mustang, because that was the other big thing. There was a Mustang convertible, 65 Mustang convertible for sale in my community when I needed to buy a car. And my parents said that I would be crazy to spend $2,500 on a car that old. <laughs> So mom and dad, you're still welcome to buy the convertible for me if you have that opportunity. Um, all right, any other joys to celebrate today? Yes. It's already been announced at the first service. Fantastic. Now for those of you who don't know, 
there's AP and there's baccalaureate, okay? So starting that in ninth grade, first of all, my heart goes out to you. That's hard. <laughs> so, excuse me. So good luck. Congratulations. Any other joys? Scott Crawford announced that, well, his parents announced this morning that he's accepted the acceptance of Worcester College. That's where he's going to be attending in the fall. Any other joys? What about concerns? Who needs special prayers this week? Anybody got any challenges coming up? And she's okay with that? Okay, so her name is Michelle Byers. She's your veterinarian. She's got, she's got some surgery to come up, but her blood numbers have not been good. So we're praying for her. All right. Any others? All right, let us pray. God, our faithful shepherd, we depend on you for everything we need, for daily food, for guidance and protection, for healing in injury and comfort in sorrow. You respond in abundant provision. Thank you for your tender care. Thank you for soothing the wounds of this life. Thank you that in the presence of en enemies, especially the last enemy of death, you are with us. Knowing your faithfulness in our lives, we bring you the lives of others, the cares of this world, entrusting all things to your goodness and mercy. Bring healing to those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Bring release to those who are held captive by old hurts. Bring freedom to those unjustly accused, relief to those burdened with debt, and comfort to all who suffer abuse of any kind. We pray for people living precariously in the midst of war. Protect, we pray, the citizens and soldiers alike and teach us to put away our weapons, taking up instead words of peace and reconciliation by the power at work in Christ. Break down the walls of hostility we build so that we may learn to live together graciously. We remember those living in the midst of drought and famine. We pray for rain to fall and crops to grow and for generosity to overflow from our own hands and resources until all your children receive their daily bread, until all your children have clean water to drink, until all your children have adequate shelter and medical care. Compel us to be better stewards of creation. Loving God, help us to see the world as you see it, to see others as you see them, to see ourselves rightly too. Because you've come into this world for judgment, we can leave our judgments behind. Pursue us all with your goodness and faithful love until goodness and faithful love fills every heart and informs every action. We pray these things in the name of the one who came that we might see, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So our lives overflow with the goodness of God sharing what we have so abundantly received. We bring now our tithes and our offerings to God with gladness and gratitude. Let us pray. In gratitude, O oh God, we come to your table, into your presence, into your house, for all that you have done for us, most especially for bringing us into the light of Jesus Christ. We offer thanks and praise. We long to live as children of light, doing what is pleasing to you and bearing the fruit of the light through Jesus Christ, who awakens those who sleep and raises those who are dead to new life. In his name we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let's rise and sing together our final song, Because of Your Love.
As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you've poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises, for compassion so amazing, when we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we are forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed. Because of your love. Brothers and sisters, go peaceably, looking upon the hearts of others. Live in Christ's light, even in the darkest valley. Trust that he's able to open your eyes, enabling you to walk by faith in his name. May the love of God pursue you, may the light of Christ enfold you, and the Holy Spirit keep you as you dwell in the house of the Lord your whole life long. Amen. Amen.